Okay, so we'll get started. Terry's lecturing today again, but um, I just want to say probably 30 seconds worth of stuff about the quiz this week. So as you know, the first assessment for the course starts this week. Um, it's an online quiz, like the online quiz you did before, but refined a little bit. We took great care in making sure that everything was um, written down carefully in the quiz. The, the questions are clear, and hopefully the answers are clear to you as well. Just to explain exactly, and this is for the online folks who are listening and our folks here today, exactly what the quiz will be looking for. We're looking for your reading of the course study guide. So that document you can download each week that was written by Terry mostly and Mike and myself contributed a little bit to that. And also some of the content from the lectures. Now it's important just to remember that the quiz is 5%. Okay, It's not a 50% quiz. So don't stress yourselves out too much about it, and also that it's going to be looking for foundational knowledge. So the quiz will really be testing you on the basics of things, and you'll see that when you get into it. When we get to the discussion board, we'll ramp it up a little bit more, so we'll be expecting you to draw not only on the course outline, but also on um, your engagement with your chosen readings for the week, and of course the lecture content, and even stuff from weeks before. You'll be able to engage in all that in the discussion board, but next week, Mike and I will be delivering the lecture, and I'll spend a good 10 minutes at the, the beginning talking through the discussion board, so we won't waste precious time now, okay? Any questions about the quiz, the online folks can just email me, um, and you folks might like to talk to me during the break. So, without further delay, thanks, Terry. Thanks, Dan. It's on, it's not yet. Yeah. Okay, um, welcome back. Um, it's it's funny how you know when you start talking about things, it starts to come at you from all over. <coughs> uh, last um, it was Wednesday, after our lecture anyway, I was travelling down to Arimba, our Central Coast campus, and listening to um, I think it was Margaret Throsby on 12:33, and uh, she was interviewing. I'm not sure if it was live or, or done when he was in Australia. <coughs> um, a fellow called Neil deGrasse Tyson, who, who is one of the world's foremost astrophysicists, actually a protege of Carl Sagan, um, a, a story of a black American made good, um, reared in the Bronx, ended up with a lot of help going and doing physics at Harvard and has just had this stellar kind of career and his main job now is as the director of the planetarium in, in New York, which of course has a community function but also houses a lot of this research that's, that I've been talking about. Um, his greatest claim to fame, or infamy as he puts it, is being the one who in the end had to really make the hard decision about Pluto and uh, whether it was a planet or, or not. And of course he made the decision that, oh, it, I mean he didn't make it alone, but he took the proposition to the academy that Pluto really didn't fit any of the standard definitions of being a planet, that it needed to be demoted. And that decision was, was taken fairly narrowly from memory. And uh, he says he, he never knew what hate mail was before you know being associated with that and most of it was coming from kids because kids like Pluto for some reason. Um, but he, he's a very interesting guy, he is right out there you know with this research looking at other worlds and what the heck's out there and string theory and all of these sorts of amazing you know absolutely left of centre kinds of scientific probes. Um, and, and he was asked at one point, um, you know, because he was talking in this way that would make you think, mm, you know, is he into God sort of thing? And <laughs> he said, um, so are you a religious person? He said, no, I, you know, steadfastly am not. He said, I, I think um, turning to religion <coughs> would be just, you know, too easy a, a way out of all of this. Um, he doesn't go for the notion of intelligent design or the supreme force like a lot of other astros. He, he doesn't want to settle for that. He thinks that could distract us from the hard scientific work that still has to be, has to be done. Um, and at one point he loosely described himself as, as an atheist. 
But when Margaret, I think it was, asked him, what is the greatest discovery for you in your career? And, you know, thinking, well, this is the guy who put Pluto in its place and heaven knows what other amazing sorts of things he's done that he'll be remembered for forever. And, and his answer was quite imponderable, I thought. <laughs> Uh, and I hope I get it right. He said it twice, and I, my ears were wobbling. Um, he said, realising that I am made of stardust, that I'm, I'm part of the universe to that extent. And in that sense, I'm immortal. And in that sense, I touch on infinity. And he went on to say, and I realise now how little we've really known all this time and I wonder just how much more there is to learn. And I thought, okay, well, here's an interesting question. Is this guy a religious person or not? And in a lot of ways, it probably depends on your definition. I mean, I heard him saying, no, he's not religious because people will misunderstand that and I think, okay, well, he just goes off to church on Sunday and does it all in a fairly simple kind of a way and there are his answers. He certainly didn't want to associate with that. He's obviously not religious in that sense. And yet he gave this from the depths of his astrophysicist probings, this remarkably kind of, certainly a non-scientific, <laughs> non-typically scientific, Sort of, a, sort of an answer. He was clearly wondering. He was imagining. He was sensing there's something more to all of this. And he didn't want simple definitions, but I thought, well, okay, if theology was framed right, I'm sure he's someone who would be interested because it is, again, I say theology that I think better than any of the disciplines that can sort of grapple with some of that loosely called otherness that I think in fact he, he, was, he was talking about. Anyway, just thought I'd share that little interesting moment. I was just about to switch off 12.33 too when he came on and I thought, well, glad I didn't. Um, okay, just a little bit of, you know, basic factuality here, just a, sort of a mile stone as we move forward. <clears throat> um, the major theology is basically from what we loosely describe as the major religions and that's a very loose term uh, and, and a little bit of a Western imperious term I think but the reality is you know if you do a typical studies of religion kind of course, the HSC course or whatever, um, there are five religions that will probably be classified as the major ones and they're an interesting selection in, in a lot of ways. Two of them are the Indian ones, Hinduism and Buddhism. And the fact that Buddhism is always included somehow or other as a religion, even though that great debate rages about you know, whether it really is or not and doesn't seem to believe in a god, or at least in its original Theravadic form, it's fairly clearly, no, there's no god. You know, these are the words that Siddhartha is said to have uttered because he doesn't want his followers to get caught up on this fairly malevolent kind of a track that he sees Hinduism as having put him through. So there's a bit of a reaction there, but, but nonetheless, you know, is there really some sort of God? Is there some sense of other? Is there some sense of transcendence sitting behind the Buddhist quest when you look at the way it developed in the Asian world? you'd have to say yes fairly explicitly because even the Buddha becomes a god in certain forms of, of, of Buddhism. In its original form in, in India, yeah, it's definitely more debatable. And uh, I mean, we had a little bit of that debate last week. You know, is, is, is it about consciousness that is totally an internal thing or is there this, this sense of, of other? And, and I think the thing we have to just be a little bit careful of there is a century and a half of the Western social science brain being put to these things. Um, religious studies developed more out of, a out of a social science frame than out of a theological frame. 
And so we'll always want to try and reduce <clears throat> what it can of God talk, transcendence talk or whatever to, you know, something biological or measurable, empirical, etc., etc. But anyway, they're, they're the two big Indian ones. And the other three are the three that we're going to start looking at today, the so-called Abrahamic religions of Judaism, Christianity and, and Islam. And it is an interesting set of five because, I mean, four of them are huge. Judaism's really very, very small, much smaller than a whole lot of other you know, religions that we might study. But it's, it's, it's influence, I suppose, particularly in, in the West that you know, puts it up there. Um, I do think that there's a lot of revision going on around, you know, just which are the most influential. And one of the candidates I see coming up fairly quickly is Confucianism. And that will be an interesting one for scholars to debate because, again, the standard version is that Confucianism is definitely not a religion, it's an ethic, it's a set of guiding principles, etc., etc. Um, and yet, we've got the enigma <laughs> of the communist government of China um, establishing a Confucius Institute of Religion. Um, and a whole lot of these Confucius Institutes around the world dealing quite explicitly with research in religion and theology. Mm, I mean, there's something very interesting going on there. Um, I've I got to say, I, I sense, as I do in even in the most original form of Buddhism, the most apparently atheistic form of Buddhism, that there is this other <laughs> that's, that's instrumental. Um, and I feel the same about Confucianism. Ren and Lee and these guiding principles are so much conceived of as universal forces holding the world together that they are um, kind of, you know, transcendent in, in that sense. But, I mean... Don't listen to me, or if you do listen to me, realise that I'm probably at this stage still a minority voice about those things. Most people would still want to say Confucianism is, is, is a set of ethics rather than a religion. Um, now, just in terms of timing, just in case you were ever asked something like this, probably useful to, to see the spread. <coughs> and uh, it was interesting some years ago... I, I opened the front door at home and a couple of very clean cut looking gents there with shirts and ties and a little bag over their shoulders and um, asked me something about whether I'd been saved or not and whether I wanted to be. Um, I actually love that, you know, I mean, I know most people don't and they probably slam the door on them and I, I, I absolutely relish it, you know. <laughs> I come to life, I love the discussion and um, just to see how long in some ways they can, you know, maybe put up with talking with someone with some theological background because most of the people obviously they're talking to don't, don't have it and wouldn't push them. And um, anyway, there was this one guy sort of probably 15 minutes into the discussion who was clearly getting a bit frustrated with me and he, and he said, you know how we know that Christianity is the true religion? And I said, no. And he said, because it's lasted 2,000 years. Look, at think of all the religions that have, you know, come and gone in the last 2,000 years and Christianity's still there. That's how we know. And I said something to the effect, well, I guess that means Buddhism's even truer and Hinduism must be at least twice as true. And I think it was about then they decided they weren't going to sell their goods and headed for the gate. Um, give or take a year or two, um, Hinduism is deemed to be about that old. And clearly, we don't have the video running to know. <laughs> but as best, the archaeologists and archaeological anthropologists and those sorts of people can do their business, something happened in the Indus Valley that we call the beginnings of Hinduism about that long ago. Um, Judaism, about that length of time. And again, a very loose kind of date. I mean, probably the first writings that we would associate with evidence about the beginnings of Judaism are way, way after that. 
but you know the distilled wisdom tends to suggest again this the roots of this Judaic thing were around about that that length of time ago. <clears throat> Buddhism we have a little more certainty about again it's not historical certainty in a Western sense but there was some kind of um, significant new movement out of Hinduism around about that several in fact I mean, was, this was a, a, a time of um, religious and theological revolution in a lot of parts of the world it's you know it's the time that um, Confucianism starts you know starts I say advisedly um, Taoism Jainism um, you know and a, a whole host of quite a quite a time of ferment including in the Indian world and and the thing we know as Buddhism you know seems to begin to develop at that point in time Christianity well you know in a way and of course we can go back a lot lot further in those primal traditions Christianity is a bit of a, a new chum even among the so-called major world religions so my friend's logic just you know didn't didn't really um, stand up to testing uh, and then Islam roughly you know 1400 years ago I mean the, 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 the wisdom would say 622 in Medina as with all of them these are all hot potato kinds of topics of debate just when and where and how and who and all of those sorts of things are things that scholars probably more today than ever you know sort of an era where churches and religious bodies have let go a bit of these things um, these things are coming into the public square and so you know avid from the 19th century on avid biblical criticism particularly in and around Christianity and questioning all sorts of things about the real beginnings and to what extent was it really new, to what extent was it really Judaic, to what extent was it influenced by a whole host of other, you know, loosely called pagan religions, all of those sorts of things. Islam, yeah, you know, 622 Medina, not a pebble of evidence. Um, there's evidence of all sorts of things from that era. There's no evidence, no that, none of that sort of hard evidence that something actually began in Medina or in Mecca at that period of time. Uh, but so there was some sort of movement. You know, maybe it was a revelation. Maybe it was a Jewish diaspora and some disenfranchised Christians down in North Africa who, you know, were looking for a new kind of Messiah. I mean, these sorts of things happen all the time. Um, some people, some Islamic scholars would say the real beginnings of Islam were with Al-Tabari 200 years on, Al-Hazali 300 years on. <laughs> These are all the sorts of things that, uh, right, what have we got here? <laughs> um, right, okay, well. See if I can finish in four and a half minutes. <laughs> um, yeah, these are the sorts of things that a serious interfaith, open, liberal theology will deal with and, and deal with well. It won't be frightened to deal with these things. Um, again, a theology that's just locked into its own little group, you know, got to prove that Christianity is exactly the way we've always thought of it. Muslim theologians who, you know, don't want to look sideways, will always try and defend um, what in the wider world of scholarship often isn't really defensible. Good theology in the public square will deal with these things and open them up and I think we're at the point in our history where they desperately need to be opened up because too many myths, unhelpful myths, particularly myths about difference and superiority and disenfranchisement abound right through the world and are creating some awful troubles. Um, okay, so what are these Abrahamic theologies? What are they really all about? How do they fulfil the definition that we've set, that three-tiered definition, dealing with other, the experiences of other, and how those things are kind of conveyed through structures? <clears throat> um, belief in other is absolutely central to the Abrahamic theologies, to Judaism, Christianity and, and Islam. They would rightly be said to be the most prominent of the 
high God religions. Not, 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 not exclusively. I mean, again, you know, I, I was taught, um, even in theological college, you know, that, that, you know, Judaism more or less invented the one high God and Christianity inherited it and Islam inherited that. <clears throat> it's clearly not, not true when you look at the primal religions and their development from, you know, animistic sorts of beliefs to partial high gods and some of them very, very high gods. The pre Incas, the very, very high god, you know, that has so much reminiscence about the god of, of Abraham. But nonetheless, in, and certainly in terms of worldwide, universal, you know, highly influential traditions, then Judaism, Christianity and Islam, its one God conception has been um, a, a mighty powerful one. So God is one, God is who is, there is no God but God kinds of statements that really underpin a high form of monotheism, an unapologetic form of monotheism. <coughs> the, in terms of the experience, well... The experience in, in all three cases directs their lives through very, very clear injunctions in the Torah, of which you know, the part we know best is the so-called Ten Commandments. Uh, in Christianity, the Great Commandment. In Islam, the Five Pillars of Faith. All sort of versions of the same thing in a way. You know, a very a high God statement at the start. You know, I am the Lord your God. You know, you know, or the first chapter of the Quran, which if we have time I'll read you, it only takes about a minute and a half, um, and then followed by the, the practicalities, the ethics. The, so if you're, you believe I'm the Lord your God, then you know, you don't steal, you don't kill, you, you love your neighbour, <coughs> you, you know, you give everything for the community around you, including you know, five, ten percent of what you earn, etc., etc., etc. Mm -hmm. It's theological. Back to this? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and, and then, um, I, I mean, one thing to say is. This is something that fascinates me and some very current scholarship. Are we actually dealing here anyway with one legend that's just sort of gone in two different directions and the names aren't all that, that different? That could be potentially some point of reconciliation if we could get people in the right edge place. Same here, you know, Jacob, Israel, variously named. Um, are we talking about the same sort of legend here or, or are we really talking about two utterly different bloodlines? as we've been um, led to believe, or at least about, about the... In, in Islamic belief, um, Jacob and Israel come from the Ishmael side. Very different sorts of, I mean, similarities, but different versions of the Moses story. Obviously, on the Judeo-Christian side, Moses is, is, is a Jew, you know, displaced Jew 400 years on. Uh, gathering the Jews, turning away from his adopted parentage in the Pharaoh's house and leading the people back. In, in his, from the Islamic side, Moses is, is Arabic. Um, he is, in fact, depending on which version you, you look at, Canaanite. He finds himself in the, as a, as a legitimate son of a Pharaoh, many hundreds of years old, the family has strayed, wandered afar, realises that this isn't what the promise is about to Abraham, wants to go back and so leads a band of people back into Canaan, the promised land, but doesn't come in and beat them up, as happens in the Judeo-Christian version, but actually comes back and reconciles long-lost brothers and sisters who then go on to form the, the new Umar, as the Muslim would say. Um, it's, it's actually, I'm going to say, it's a much, it's a much nicer story <laughs> than, than the one you tend to read in, in, in the Bible. It's a much more peaceful kind of story. But the same kind of event. The prophets, of course, become absolutely crucial 
for, for all players. Um, but again, the prophets in Islam are very much the heroes. In the Judeo-Christian story, the prophets are a bit like a faithful opposition. You've got the kings and the priests over here and the prophets are saying, yeah, but hang on, don't forget this and that. Um, you know, God doesn't want all the fancy stuff. He wants justice and mercy to flow like a river, blah, blah. Um, in, in Islam, the prophets are the only ones who understand the whole kingship, the priesthood, the Temple of Solomon was all a terrible mistake. And they used Moses coming down from the mountain. You don't understand. You know, crashing the, the tablets on the, on the rock. You don't understand. It's not to be this kind of, you know, we're going to be another nation like other nations with our own temples and our own priesthood with our own armies. We're going to be the special people who care for each other. Um, the prophets were the only ones who knew and so, whereas for this, by the way, is kind of where the Judaic line stops. They're not interested in anything much from here. And where Christianity then takes up and obviously feeds off the Jewish heritage that's gone before. Um, but whereas Christians sort of head the bets a bit about Jesus as priest, prophet and king, you know, a bit of, bit of kingship and priesthood over there, but prophet over there. Um, the Muslims are absolutely unapologetic about the fact that Jesus is a prophet. He was not in any way, shape or form, a priest or a king, consistent with their theology that the prophets are actually the keepers of the flame of the promise and not, not the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. Um, and, and Mary, and I put Mary in there um, largely again to, to make the point about the importance of what Islam contributes to all this and, and I'm, I'm sorry to labour it but it is the big gap in Western knowledge and understanding that's creating so many difficulties in the world we live in. Um, there's more about Jesus in the Quran than in the Gospel. <laughs> there's way more about Mary in the Quran, in the Quran and the Hadith than than we find in the Gospels. In fact, what's left in the four Gospels that are left to us, the other 52 or so, haven't been discussed, what's left to us is, is a pretty milksop kind of a, a Mary figure. It's not terribly interesting. The Mary we find in some of the earlier Gospels that were discarded, and certainly the, the Mary that we find in the Quran is quite prophetic. And she's, she's, a real, she's a real gal. You, you wouldn't mix with her, you wouldn't mess with her. Um, and so Islam has preserved some very important parts of the Abrahamic heritage, including about early Christianity, that Christians themselves have lost, and reminded of it. And then, of course, we come to Muhammad, and this is where Christianity gets off the bus, and Muhammad is, is posited as the last and the greatest of the prophets. And no way in the world is he a priest. Or a king. <laughs> and least of all, of course, is, is he a god? And that's the other thing that you see that Islam, that Islam differs hugely in its estimation of who Jesus was. He was a great prophet, but certainly not, not God. The covenant, the notion of covenant, is absolutely central. It's just another word for promise. It, it, it implies the monotheistic one high God of all creation um, choosing a people. So one God in relationship with a chosen people. Of course the big issue for the Abrahamic tradition, and again this is alive today as ever, is you know, so who does that mean? <laughs> Depends on who you ask. Does it mean Jews? Or does it mean Christians? Or does it mean Muslims? To ask someone, in, you know, the extreme orthodox side of Judaism, it's quite clear it'll be Jews, and not only Jews, but our sorts of Jews, not those other sorts of Jews. They're not part of it. You ask Christians, or again, depends, you know, you ask faith, or Catholics, you know. You ask the uh, Southern Evangelicals, no, it's us, you know, we're the only ones, you know, forget those other Christians. 
Uh, you asked the Muslim, well, as I said last week, most of the killing happening in the Middle East at the moment is moving off on Muslim. So, you know, Sunni or Shiite or you know, like all hate Ismaili Muslims. <laughs> Um, and it's, there's some big issues for this family. It makes Gina's family look quite functional, I suggest. Um, or does it mean all three? And I guess that's one of the big tasks for the Abrahamic religions at some point to, to sort it out. And, and is it being optimistic to say at some point they might sort out? Well, maybe, maybe not. A professor of mine used to say about Christianity, sort of say, you know, in all the mistakes, you know, can it ever prepare itself? And so what we've got to remember is when Christianity is 10,000 years old, the first 2,000 years just look like the church in mountains. <laughs> a long way to go, so let's not lose hope. And it's that sort of rather humble view that we don't see enough of in, in religious authorities, I think. <laughs> you know, we're overseeing something. We were, you know, shepherding the sheep through a long, long journey and we can't afford to admit some mistakes and move on. All, all three, yeah, why not? Why not? Or, or, you'll be a light to the nations. Is that really the function of the Abrahamic theology is to somehow open the doors to all people about you know this loving God? I mean, again, my friend Dietrich Bonhoeffer used to say that you know, this God is Lord of the world, <coughs> um, clearly wants to be Lord of all the world, <laughs> wants to be there for everybody, and that should be, any authentic religion should be preaching that message, you know, that, that God's in the world, but you know, like it or not, you know, he's, he's everywhere, you can't get away from him. You can deny it, and, you know, it's our belief, it doesn't matter if you call yourself a Muslim or Hindu or whatever you like, it's God's, God's there. But what religions tend to do is, of course, Give the opposite message. No, 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 no. God's not in the world. No, no. God, God's over here. He's with us. You know, you've got to come and join us. And get down in some sort of church or mosque or whatever it might be, and then you'll find God. So religions actually are, in that sense, antithetical to what God's all about. And of course, there's the land connection, and especially around Jerusalem and. <laughs> There's a whole course in itself, <laughs> Jerusalem 1040. Um, the ethical relational connection, again, with, with the, the issues of, of the book, the great ethical principles, uh, all, as I suggest, you know, rather similar sorts of codes. The belief statement first, and then, uh, you know, the practicalities, what flows from that. <coughs> So in common, uh, the belief in the one high God, the creator of all, loving of all, uh, the relationship through worship, practical action, <coughs> they are, the Abrahamic religions, a kind of a, a tree of religions, <coughs> say in the guide there, it's often loosely, you know, the analogy of the oak tree or that, um, Judaism being the trunk. <laughs> Christianity being this one huge branch and Islam being another huge branch up the pile. Um, doesn't take enough account of all of the things that actually fed Judaism in the first place. You know, I think maybe a better analogy actually is of this huge, huge trunk of all of the religious influences that eventually became the thing we call Judaism, which is a you know, a branch in itself and then Christianity a branch up the branch and Islam and further branch off the ground. But I don't want to get too carried away with the trees. Okay, so let's just have a look at um, <coughs> Judaic theology or theologies. Um, with all of these, we are dealing with theologies. Uh, these are religions with huge differences within. Um, I mentioned the primal influences, they're, they're huge, they're huge. Um, you know, some of the Assyrian, some of the Persian influences in the formation of, of, of Judaism, um, you know, some really very sophisticated God concepts <clears throat> that these people with much bigger and more powerful and more influential civilizations 
would have had, and probably many, many others. So you know, the notion that somehow you know, out of the blue, um, this one guy appears to Abraham and it starts a whole new way of thinking about God, it's a bit simplistic. <coughs> but again, that would be a course in itself. There's a huge prehistory to the thing called Judaism. Um, but what Judaism comes to connote in theological terms is, is clearly the theology of the one God in relationship with his, uh, his creatures. And again, that's not totally original, but the strength of it was, was probably you know, the, uh, the strength of a people struggling. Most of the Judaic history is, is, a, is a history of struggle, where they haven't had the power. <laughs> They haven't had theologies that they can impose on you know, other peoples. <clears throat> and so they have tended to close in on themselves a lot and, and their theology has become something that kind of keeps them going. It's a little bit like you know, the, the black Americans in you know, the pre-civil rights times during the Civil War and, and whatever. You know, um, being told, you know, you're just a black, you've got no rights, you know, this, that, and the other thing. Um, theology, a theology of a God who loves, who cares, you know, you're not just a black, you're a, you're a child of God, becomes really important. You get some of that sort of underdog, you know, fighting against the system almost, um, uh, theological dependence coming through in, in Judaism. And so they, I would suggest they borrowed the notion of a high God from elsewhere. Not borrowed, it's come to them gradually, but it's become so important because of the situations they find themselves in. And so the theology is that, that this one God really has chosen the Jews. They are the chosen people, not many of them, but they're the special ones, they're the chosen people, and revealed that through Abraham, who was to be the father of this special people. They might be small, they mightn't have all the trappings that other people have, but they would be God's people and that would be their pride. In many ways, that's, that's at the heart of what Judaism has been you know, for thousands of years and continues to be today. <coughs> and so, yep, chosen people in a chosen land, that's what the covenant was, was all about. <coughs> the covenant then, from the Jewish point of view, passes through Isaac, second son but the legitimate one to succeeding generations through Jacob, Judah, and this is where the Jew name comes from, the Judahites, uh, who becomes the one who stays in, in the original land while Joseph, the younger son, um, goes up in his technical dream coat. You've seen it, gets sold into slavery, um, <coughs> ends up in Egypt and a whole new progeny. It's created 400 years old, which you know Moses comes along. Moses then leads the people from exile in Egypt to reclaim the chosen land, which is the land that truly is is there. Which is God was leading them through this trial. It wasn't just an exile. It wasn't meaningless. Uh, it wasn't that our God had left us. We had bigger plans. It's, you know, all of this. That if you think of, if you think of what. Jewish people, you know, went through in the Holocaust. You can imagine how important some of this sort of history would, would become. I mean, to be to be fair, Judaism has gone to sleep on itself quite a few times through through, through history, but it's always revived itself out of out of crisis. That's what started Zionism in the 19th century, escaping from. You know, the horrors particularly of Northern European anti-Semitism. It's really why a lot of the troubles began down in the Middle East, because these zealous people who have been so, you know, whatever from a great height, um, ended up down in this, this land with a great sense of who they were and their escape, but not a great sense probably of who the people, people were Palestinians who lived there for centuries and lived. Um, and then, you know, the Holocaust fairly clearly for such a devastating event. You can imagine how these theologies would become revived. You know, 
somehow God's with us even in this, and he'll lift us up again. And so after the war, Israel's formed, again, not with a huge amount of concern about the people who've been there for centuries. And you know, here we go, 50, 60 years later, we talk to Christ over the way. Um, there was a period of conquest once they get back into the land, and certainly in the Judeo-Christian version of it, it is a conquest. These Jewish people come back and beat up on the Canaanites, who, you know, like free Palestinians, um, and they establish their own kingdom, initially of the United Kingdom of Israel. The, the high age is with the three great kings of Saul, or Talmud, in Arabic, David and Talmud, Solomon and Solomon. And then there's a period of divided kingdoms with Israel to the north and Judah to the south. And then it's in the south, of course, that Jerusalem rises. <clears throat> and then there's the period of vanquish. Um, firstly, Israel, the northern kingdom, the Assyrians in the 8th, 9th century. We can get a dispute that one. <clears throat> um, but again, you know, the Assyrians, my goodness. <laughs> The, the, the Assyrian gods were a very sophisticated group of gods that, you know, that they would take over Israel and not leave some influence is inconceivable. Um, and then Judah, a couple of centuries later, falls to the Persians first, and the Greeks, and then the Romans, and of course it's in that era that Jesus comes along. Again, these are all very theological kinds of traditions. They've got lots and lots of gods. Some of the Persians were most sophisticated you know, in the history of time. Um, and Judah in particular learned to accommodate a lot of Persian influence, especially to some extent Greek, a bit more oppositional to the Rome. But that they would have developed some of their God concepts out of the Persians. <laughs> you couldn't not. You couldn't not. And no doubt there was some quid pro quo too. The Persian theology was influenced by everything, such a religiously zealous sort of a, a group in their kingdom. And it's out of all of this, of course, that the theology of the Messiah comes. The Messiah will be the one who will come to turn around the vanquish, put us all back together again, uh, take us back to our own land, um, with our own temple. Etc. The chosen people back in the chosen land, and the big symbol of it, the restoration of Solomon's temple. Okay, um, just a quick little YouTube, just just a, a Jewish guy sort of talking about his his estimation, his understanding of what Judaism means. Um, and then we'll take a quick little break and have a look at Christianity. The receiving end comes through from the Judaism, I'm quite convinced that is where their particular version of monotheism and the high God is. With this, regardless of who has, has, has come from. And obviously, a lot of that feeds then into um, the beginnings of Christianity. You can imagine the, the way the early Christians, you know, also persecuted to put all this together in their head and go and mark them. But anyway, um, let's, let's have a, just a five minute or see you back here. Okay, so we're off again, yep. <coughs> Okay, um, I won't spend a huge amount of time on Christianity because we will be looking at some length at the development of Christian theologies through, through the ages, but just to place it in the context of the Abrahamic theologies where it fits in, quite obviously, you know. So we're told Jesus is born and read as a Jew, so all of that history, that understanding of God, is, is in him and in those around him. You know, there is no understanding where that came from without understanding the, 
the Jewish roots. Um, <clears throat> his disciples, first Christians, well, grounded in various forms, whether they were grounded or not is <laughs> probably debatable. I mean, they were fishermen and, and whatever. Uh, they certainly weren't rabbis, but, <clears throat> but nonetheless, the only kind of theology they would have had would have been the theology as described. <clears throat> um, some of the early theologies that develop about Jesus, incarnation, that is, you know, God made man, that he is the Messiah, he is the Messiah that is to come, which is probably the most distinguishing mark of those early Christians who are actually Jews, Jewish Christians in a sense. <clears throat> That's all seen through Judaic eyes and in some ways Peter, the so-called you know, rock on which the church is built, the, the one who takes charge <clears throat> of the disciples after Jesus goes, um, he, he's a rather good um, uh, caricature in some ways of this incarnation messianic theology being seen through Judeo guys. It, the whole thing is for the Jews, really. It's not for anyone else. Um, and if anyone else wants to be part of it, someone wants to follow this new cause, this Christian cause, well, they've They've got to be a Jew. There's no, from Peter's point of view, there's no understanding any of this. You can't, can't legitimately call yourself a child of Abraham except by becoming a Jew. And then, you know, if you like, the, the sect of Jewish Christians. <clears throat> so he sees it absolutely and utterly through Judaic eyes. Uh, and, and one of the things that, that happens most starkly in the early church, of course, is that <clears throat> there is this huge debate. Uh, classically between Peter and St Paul who wasn't one of the early disciples who comes to Christianity from a very different background having uh, been a Roman citizen having been soaked up in Greek education Greek culture but also Jewish uh, truly one of the you know cosmopolitan people of the day <clears throat> and and he he sees um, this this phenomenon what's happening here much more widely that God becoming man, um, the Messiah having come, it's quite beyond Jewish boundaries. And so you don't have to become a Jew in order to become a Christian. And that's, that's pretty challenging. You know, poor old Pete, he can't get his head around that one and no doubt most of the early followers wouldn't have. <clears throat> it's, it's Paul's you know, strength as a character and as a theologian that, that gets that message across. Um, cleverly, what Paul does, of course, he's a very educated guy, he, he calls on a range of testimony, including, by this stage, you've got some of the early Gospels that have been written down. Um, he calls on some of the disciples' own testimony about the sorts of things that Jesus said. It makes it pretty clear that Jesus himself wasn't locked into that Judaic world. You know, he talks about a good Samaritan. No such thing as a good Samaritan, as far as a good Jew was concerned. He, he told those sorts of stories about reaching out beyond, you know, the cultural Jewish religion, um, that people can be good because of what they do, not because of, you know, what you say at one stage, you know, you call yourselves children of Abraham and say, that's going to save you. You know, God can turn those rocks in the on the ground in the children of Abraham if he wants to. That's not where your salvation is. Your salvation is in doing the good, you know, hearing the power of the Ten Commandments, etc., etc. Um, and so Paul crafts a Christianity that is for the world using a range of data. I mean, he, he's, he is steeped in Jewish theology. He uses it. He uses the words of the disciples themselves about the things that Jesus said and did <clears throat> and he employs a range of other sort of you know draws on Greek thinking and Roman kinds of artifacts <laughs> uh, to create a message that can go out to the world and he himself travels all around the place to vastly different cultures taking the Christian message which Peter could never have done <clears throat> uh, and, and would never have been done if Christianity had just been locked into a Jewish world. I mean, you know, being Jew wasn't 
it wasn't um, high status. <laughs> You know, just a tiny little beaten up culture in the, you know, the tail end of all of the empires of the world. Uh, so if Christianity had just stayed locked up in that, it was going nowhere. Certainly would never have become what eventually it does become, the imperial religion. You know, three centuries on, Christianity is the most powerful religion in the world as we know it at the time. <clears throat> and the other point I make there, that is in, it's out of some of Paul's early theologising that the notion of Trinity first starts to develop in, in Christianity. So that's really just to show how Christianity sort of springs from Judaism but then grows quite beyond it. It becomes, you know, rather than a locked-in, culturally-oriented Abrahamic religion... It becomes the Abrahamic religion for all people. And it's all of that then that, that feeds into to Islam <clears throat> however many centuries later. And again, you know, there's stories within stories within stories. Just where Islam began, how much pre-Islamic, how much of that Arabic influence that was always there on Judeo-Christianity is what Islam grows out of, did Islam really begin somewhere you know, around the 3rd or the 4th century as displaced Jews and Christians kind of started looking for new Messiah figures and th there's all sorts of very interesting theologising going on. <clears throat> but just staying with the, the broad story at the moment, Islam uh, begins in around the, the 7th century um, of the Christian era. Uh, the character Muhammad is clearly the, the central character. Um, Muslims clearly believe, most Muslims would believe that Muhammad was a true character, just as most Christians would believe, you know, that Jesus was an historical character. Um, the theology is that, that in the line of the prophets, he was the last and the greatest. So that, that's it. I was just being asked in the break, you know, does, does Islam have a messianic concept? No, it doesn't need it because um, the final prophet has come and has established the people of God in the Umar, the community, the, in, in Islam effectively. So there's no need for a Messiah once you've got the, the people in place. <clears throat> He's the final inheritor of the covenant. Um, his, his lineage is carefully tracked back through to Abraham to show that he's in that line, <clears throat> you know, coming down through Ishmael, Hagar, all of that. <clears throat> he establishes the Umar Wahidah, the, 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 the people of God, you know, supposedly in the first community in Medina in 622, he sets up the ideal people along strictly prophetic lines. The prophet said, you know, don't want all the fancy stuff, the rituals and the priesthoods and all of that. want justice and mercy to flow like a river. So that's what he does. So the story goes. He, he sets up a community that's very, very light on ritual, has no priesthood. <clears throat> they just sit around, they read the Quran, which is the revelation you know, given by the archangel directly to Muhammad, so they believe. And, and the practical action, the morality, the ethics of the community is all wrapped up in the five pillars. And, and so you get this beautiful image of a, a welfare state a thousand years before the welfare states of Europe. You know, you've got a community where education is emphasised, universal health care... Um, women's equality, <laughs> uh, all, all sorts of things that wouldn't come into the West for a thousand years are described, imaged in those early communities. Now, as I said before, there's not actually a pebble of evidence of any of that happening in Medina and Mecca at the time, but there is plenty of evidence of it happening in Moorish Spain, in southern Spain, some centuries on, in places like Cordoba and Toledo and Granada, <clears throat> where, where there is more than pebbles. I mean, if you've been to any of those places, you'd have seen the magnificent leftovers of those cities that 
were created in the name of Islam in and around you know the the the, the high Middle Ages, um, where they actually, in fact, the the famous one when uh, King Ferdinand of Christopher Columbus fame was sending his army south to Granada to uh, destroy uh, La Lumbra, the beautiful Islamic city where, in fact, some of the best Christian translations of holy books was done. You know, some of the high age, when there wasn't much intellectual activity happening in, in Christendom at the time, most of it was actually happening in Islamic states because education was encouraged. Uh, Gundas Alavis and these sorts of bishops who did all the major translating from you know Greek into Arabic and back into Latin so that it could go out you know in, into the into the, the West as it were um, all did their work in Islamic princedoms about the only place in Europe where they were actually free to do truly academic intellectual scholarship but when Ferdinand, and, and they had running water and they had street lights and all this sort of stuff. So when Ferdinand tells his generals to go south and trash this place, he's alleged to have said, funny people, these Muslims, they, they have this thing about running water. And what's even funnier, they think everybody should get some of it. And it bespeaks the difference between the Dark Ages happening in, in northern Spain in Christendom, Spain, and, and the kind of enlightenment that actually Islam had, had brought into its part of the world. And some of those sore points uh, haven't been forgotten either. So, he, so the legend has it establishes this model, prophetically oriented people. What God said to Abraham he wanted, Muhammad finally delivers. Moses had a crack at it, didn't work because they got all caught up in priesthoods and king kingdoms and becoming a nation like other nations. Jesus had a crack at it in the early church and early Christianity and then you know, by the third and fourth centuries, Christian, Christianity is just sold out to the empire and concerned with the material and the power. And so Muhammad's the one who finally delivers. That's the classic Islamic view. <coughs> So he builds on and reforms the Abrahamic tradition, um, uses a lot of Judaic material in what's loosely called the Israelite, which is largely pickings from what we'd call the Old Testament and heavily, clearly around the prophetic literature, but also a lot of the Psalms, a lot of the wisdom literature and a potpourri of you know, some of the... the the books of the so-called Pentateuch, those early books of the Bible, Genesis and Exodus, etc., but often translated a bit, those ones. Um, and on Christianity, whereas what's built out of Judaism is heavily around the textual, what's built from Christianity is heavily around the person of Jesus. <clears throat> um, the New Testament, as we know, it plays no part whatever in, in Islam. Some of the early... Gospels, we'll see later on, get thrown out. The Council of Nicaea, yes, they do play some part. That's probably the Jesus that Muhammad came to know. <clears throat> but Jesus is an inspirational character in Islam. He is Muhammad's own prophet. He's the second greatest prophet, if you like. He's superseded only by Muhammad. And Muhammad refers to, to Jesus continually. There's, as I said before, more about Jesus in the Quran than in, in the Gospels. And if you add, that, add the Hadith to that, then you get this very, very rich so-called Muslim Gospel, these scattered sayings of Jesus that Islam has preserved. And it's, it's fascinating stuff because it's partly the Jesus that we know from the New Testament but there's a lot more of it. It's much richer. It's much more dynamic. He is more prophetic. No holds barred. You know, he's ranting and raving at times about establishments. You know, priests and kings and all of the people who've got it wrong. Traditional religion, institutional religion. You know, 
God loves true religion, he says at one stage, but hates nothing more than those who make a craft out of religion and subjugate other people as a result of it. <laughs> it's, it's pretty powerful stuff and probably sourced from a lot of the very earliest writings from Christians about, about, about Jesus. So it's, it's Jesus, but it's a Jesus with, with a difference quite likely much closer to whatever the original experience was. And it's, from my point of view, theologically a bit tragic, if not very tragic, that Christianity itself has lost touch with some of its very, very earliest testimony. It's one of the great things about the kind of dialogue that one can only dream of between Islamic and, and Christian Jewish theologians, and some of it's happening, but not enough of it, that eventually everyone will understand themselves way, way better. And sometime we'll all look back and say, my God, weren't they, weren't they narrow in their understanding, those Christians who still had their nappies on? <laughs> and what, what comes out of, of the whole blamange of... <laughs> Judaism and Christianity and Islam rattling in and around each other is somewhere between this time and what then sort of pops up in and around those amazing civilizations, particularly in Spain, uh, the remarkable civilizations, the remarkable scholarship that was there, better scholarship than there'd been since the high age of the Greeks, 1500 years before, is uh, an Arabic Islamic version of the whole Abrahamic tradition. Very cogent, very together, very logical, very plausible, that in actual fact the whole tradition is based on very, very ancient Arabic sources. That, that it actually didn't start with a Jewish thing so much as a broadly Arabic, Assyrian, Persian <laughs> set of influences. Um, in all sorts of terms, including around notions of, 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 of God. Uh, and, uh, I mean, one of the, the sore points in Islamic scholarship these days is that that viewpoint, which was so clearly there in, in civilizations that were smashed and that were so much, so superior in every respect, from its scholarship to its, its idea of how to put life together for people um, by people who had no scholarship and absolutely no sense of <laughs> how to construct communities that ordinary folk could live and breathe in, <coughs> is that so little of that is appreciated, including the fact that, that some of the greatest work that's ever been done in Christianity, some of the greatest scholarship happened in those communities and what didn't happen in those communities fed into the likes of Thomas Aquinas and whatever and were used by the Christian West later. So little of that is understood or appreciated by the West. It, it just becomes another instance of, you know, the privileging of a Western view over, over Islam. These are some of the things we've really got to unpick <laughs> or, you know, life's going to continue to be very uncomfortable for us. And so, you know, just the issue is, is was this a revision? <laughs> That's what the Arabic Abrahams often referred to by Judeo-Christian Western scholars, a kind of a revising and plagiarising. Or is it actually a recovery of, of what was there originally? <coughs> For Islam, <clears throat> there's no God but God, so clearly it rejects roundly Judeo-Christian messianic theologies. It's not interested in messiahs at all from either Judaism or Christianity. Uh, least of all, you know, their wonderful prophet Jesus would be, you know, sullied with <laughs> the notion of being a messiah. Um, clearly rejects Christianity's incarnation theology, God made man is the ultimate heresy. There can't be a God, no God but Allah. There can't be a God but God. 
um, and, and similarly, obviously, rejects Christianity's Trinity theology that waters down the notion of one God, no God but God, <clears throat> and actually uses Jesus or Esau's own testimony in the Quran to reject them. So in the words of Jesus in the Quran, he's saying about himself, I'm the servant of Allah. He's given me the gospel and ordained me a prophet. He's commanded me to be steadfast in prayer and give alms to the poor. He's exhorted me to honour my mother and has purged me of vanity and wickedness. And then it goes on, such was Jesus. He was the son of Mary and that's the whole truth. Forget about this being son of God. He was the son of Mary. He was a damn good prophet. Second only to Muhammad, but that's it. Don't ruin Jesus. You know. <laughs> Don't ruin the prophetic witness by sort of turning him into a god. And Muhammad, of course, goes on to say, and whatever you do, <laughs> you guys who are left after me, don't turn me into a god because that will, you know, sully my message as well. <clears throat> so points of difference between the three. In, in the negative terms, Judaism clearly rejects Christianity's incarnational and messianic claims. God can't become a man um, and Jesus is definitely not the Messiah. <clears throat> the Messiah is yet to come. It rejects Islam's monotheistic and Umar claims, that is, Islam's claims to have finally posited the, the monotheistic God, unsullied and untampered, and to have established the people of God, quite clearly. I mean, Judaism couldn't continue to function without rejecting those things. <clears throat> Christianity rejects Judaism's exclusivity claims that, that, that you know, they're the chosen people, quite clearly. Christianity, Paul at least, broke out of that. <clears throat> Anyone can be a child of Abraham. You, you don't have to go through Judaism. Um, and it rejects Islam's supersession claims, which means Islam's claims to be the ultimate, if you like, of the Abrahamic religions, be the final testament. I mean, again, quite clearly, any religion that's looking to preserve itself is going to reject those sorts of claims. <clears throat> oh yeah, well, you know, we Christians are pretty good, but if you really want to know who God is, you know, go to the Muslims. I mean, it's not going to happen. Politically, it's not going to happen. <clears throat> and Islam rejects Judaism's originality claims. This is a really key one, and this scholarship is growing. It's putting a lot of cogency around it. Um, <clears throat> that the whole thing actually was more of Arabic foundations, perhaps. You know, way back, they were the combination of primal influences. Um, <clears throat> and rejects Christianity's Jesus patronage. You know, Jesus is our God. Well, he's not. He was a prophet for all, um, as far as Islam's concerned. But on the positive side, the great commonality and where some of the theologies can, perhaps to good effect, work together over time, <clears throat> from an interfaith theological perspective, you can kind of get up, get the eagle eye view of it and get out from the politics of the various institutions. <clears throat> the big common other is that monotheistic claim. God is one. I mean, one would think, you could work on that, just like Gina's kids could work on that if they wanted to. Well, I've got one, one mum, one dad, I think. <clears throat> or maybe not, I don't know. Certainly one mum. Um, I mean, it gives you something to work on in common. The common experience that this God is a, a God who relates, uh, a, a creative lover of his, her, its people, and, and, and the world created... <clears throat> and the common structure that we are all children of, of Abraham. And, and, and it's interesting, as we sort of move into a more unapologetic kind of interfaith era, it's interesting to me to hear people saying more freely, describing themselves. I mean, it's still a very rare perspective, but people, rather than describing themselves as Jew, Christian or Muslim, describing themselves as a child of Abraham recognising that they're part of this broader tradition, this broader family, 
with way more potential to understand each other and work together in common for the good of the world than has been demonstrated to this point in time. Okay, and I'll just give you a bit of a, a look now. It's about a little nine or minute thing, I think, of, of some of these people. I've met some of these people, the most exciting people, I think, around the theological world, um, who, who are really working on this notion of being a child of Abraham, whatever background you've come from, and what possibilities for accord that, that holds. More than just one way in which the power...